The economic cost of harmful carbon emissions may be much higher than previously thought. Scientists say the long-term effects of greenhouse gases could cut global GDP by up to 37% by the year 2100. The revelations come just as world leaders are meeting for the COP26 climate summit in Glasgow. They're signing a number of agreements to cut global heating and protect rainforests. But scientists and climate activists say it's not enough. Moba Nasser reports. This small frozen pond is all that remains of what was once among Switzerland's largest glaciers. Due to rising global temperatures, 500 Swiss glaciers have vanished since 1900 and the government says 90% of those remaining will be lost by the end of this century. Speaking at the COP26 conference in Glasgow, the UN chief says world leaders must do more to cut harmful emissions. The science is clear. We know what to do. First, we must keep the goal of 1.5 degrees Celsius alive. This requires greater ambition on mitigation and the immediate concrete action to reduce global emissions by 45 percent by 2030. G20 countries have a particular responsibility as they represent around 80 percent of emissions. Many of the world's largest economies have committed to reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. 2070. By 2070, India will achieve the target of net zero emissions. But climate activists say these pledges are vague and delay actions that are needed immediately. And new research suggests the toll of human activities on the environment is much higher than previously thought. Scientists had earlier concluded that the economic cost of one tonne of carbon dioxide emissions is about $1,000. But accounting for the long-term effects of these harmful discharges, new research by a group of British researchers has found the real cost could be as high as six times that. And by the turn of the century, global GDP may be cut by 37%, more than twice the drop seen during the Great Depression. They say these findings should add more urgency to efforts to combat global heating. And critics say the global summit has not achieved enough. Inside COP, there are just politicians and people in power pretending to take our future seriously, to, pretending to take the present seriously of the people who are being affected already today by the climate crisis. Change is not going to come from inside there. That is not leadership. This is leadership. On Tuesday, more than 90 countries agreed to cut methane gas emissions by 30% by 2030. But some of the biggest polluters, like China and Russia, are absent. And even those countries which have previously pledged funds to fight the climate crisis have not paid up. As governments negotiate over who pays how much and how soon they can end the use of fossil fuels and other pollutants, the future of the planet and mankind is hanging in the balance. Mubin Nasser. TRT World. And we're joined now by Jamo Kikstra in Vienna. He's a researcher at the Centre for Environmental Policy at Imperial College London. And Jacobo Ocharan is global lead of the Oxfam Climate Initiative, who's at the COP26 summit in Glasgow. Welcome to you both. Jacobo, if I could begin with you. You're attending COP26 right now. I know it's only early days and there are 10 more days until the summit does come to an end. But what are your early impressions of this year? Is gathering. Do you get the sense that delegates there are eager for some concrete outcomes at the end of this event? Well, uh, hi. Uh, and actually, um, our, our own impressions so, um, is we are not we are not really optimistic, and particularly we are not optimistic of what we are seeing uh, coming from from the G20 in Rome. Okay, we hear countries to emphasize on the, the, the richest economies in the world to emphasize on what they've been saying and what, on, on what their national plans are. And when we see their national plans for reduction in, uh, reducing emissions, um, the calculation is being made by, by the UN, so it's by, by obviously an independent uh, organism. And, and it's clear that with the promises for the coming years, the, the, the planet is going to hit over two 0.7 degrees. So that means that we are going well above of the Paris Agreement uh, maximum, which was two degrees. So um, the signs are not good. 
Um, the speeches that we hear yesterday, it was clearly a divide between those rich countries that they are promising a bit more money, a bit more cuttings, but not enough in, in any, of, you know, any of, of that. And, and plenty of countries saying, listen, we are drowning, we are drying, we are dying. So it's not just a matter of economy and GDP, it's a matter of survival. Jarmo, we know one of the most uh, significant outcomes of recent climate summits was getting a, a global consensus to limit temperature rises to 1.5 degrees or below. But your latest research has sought to quantify the climate crisis in economic terms rather than uh, temperature averages. Tell us what you found. Right. We broadly found three things. And the first is that economic models of climate change used to guide policymaking may have substantially underestimated the cost of continued warming. And that's because we find that it's unlikely that economic growth would continue unaffected by climate change if we don't reduce greenhouse gas emissions soon. So therefore, it means that also from a perspective of economic modeling, very strong mitigation and climate adaptation is urgently needed. Okay, Jacobo, we've already had one major agreement announced, and that's a pledge by more than 100 countries to cut and even reverse deforestation by the year 2030. Among the signatories of that agreement is Brazil's Jair Bolsonaro, who, as we know, is actually responsible for opening up more of the Amazon to logging and farming. What do you think of this latest agreement? Is it a step in the right direction? Well, it, it is it's a step in the right direction, and the, uh, you know, as long as it is, as it is protected. But we need to be thinking that uh, quite a lot of the work uh, or of the of the economy that is being thinking uh, uh, in terms of of, uh, of of capturing emissions is what uh, you know. Many of the plagues that we that countries are making on what they call net zero is about trying to compensate the emissions that we do uh, uh, for climate for climate change, and this is going very much on the basis that. Uh, you know, the existing forests need to be protected, but we can even need to create more areas, OK? Um, we are warning very much in Oxfam, you know, with this idea of net zero. So it's important, definitely, that, uh, that uh, countries count, cut emissions in the first place. And then, of course, all protections of forest and new forestry, whatever is possible, is a, a next step. But the cutting on emission is crucial to start with. And Jarmo, your research, as you mentioned, examined the economic cost of the climate crisis and you found that uh, the global economy could be 37% worse off this century, which is actually twice the drop that we saw during the Great Depression in the 1930s. I explain to us where in the world will this economic pain be felt the most and which industries are going to be hit hardest? Yeah, so it's important that these numbers are quite uncertain, but what's very clear in our sh study shows this again, is what many studies have shown before, those in the global south that are most vulnerable and also have contributed least to climate change are the ones likely to be affected most. And from our work, it's, it's difficult to say which industries exactly will be affected most, but it's clear, very clear, that the impact will be felt across economies, across different industries, and with increasing temperatures and increasing frequency of weather extremes, mitigation just becomes dire. And Jacobo, you and Oxfam have been very vocal about the unequal impacts of the climate crisis, that is, uh, it's poorer nations that are actually bearing the brunt of this climate emergency, and it's those nations are in fact the least to blame for global heating. Can you explain to us more why that is, and uh, is that issue actually being acknowledged at COP26 this year? Well, the issue of inequality is crucial to understand the climate crisis, okay? And this is something that is not acknowledged uh, by the countries, because if they would be acknowledging that, probably the full, a, full, a totally different approach we, we, we will be having here. The fact is the 1% uh, of the population, the, the richest 1% of the population of the world, okay, is responsible of as much emission as the 50% poorest population, so half of the population, okay? Um, so, and then, of course, it is, the, as, as, you know, as, as we are saying, that the population, that the people that is suffering this the most is those that they are, you know, that they are poorer and they are in worse condition. So you have the ones that they are 
contributing the most to this crisis, suffering the less and vice versa. So if we want to have any approach exactly uh, um, uh, around this uh, injustice, we really need to be thinking about uh, how we are going to be approached. And actually, uh, he, yesterday and today, what we are hearing for countries, those affected, is to bring again to the table yeah. the issue of loss of damage. Loss of damage is something crucial, basically to compensate, to receive the losses that they are already there, the, the losses that they have been creating due to a century or more of development for many countries. And now poor countries are suffering. So for us, we think that's, that's crucial also. This is something that it needs to come in, the, in this in this COP. Um, um, we need to reactivate it because it was put somehow in the fridge in the, okay. in the Paris Agreement and uh, from last COP. And now we really want to get out of here with this, with this uh, clear picture about how we are going to be working on loss and damage. And on that note, Jacobo Otteran in Glasgow and Jarmo Kickstra in Vienna, thank you so much again both for joining us here on Money Talks.